Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to a quick Q and A session. So, um, welcome to all of you that joined this session this afternoon. It was definitely very short notice, but um, so I appreciate all of you coming on here and um, attending the session. So it's going to be very short. It's just um something which we decided through a shortcuts we're going to start doing. We're going to start doing a weekly session, which is just a Q and A session for you to just come on here. And um, just ask any questions that you have regarding your, your training, any challenges you have. And the whole idea is just to help you. It's just to give any sort of advice, any sort of guidance, any sort of tips that can obviously help you succeed just to make life a lot easy for you. So um, um, if you just want to put a comment, um, just, dial, um, just put that where you're dialing in from today. And if you have any questions, it is, it is a free flow. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask about your pre-reg, you know, what to study, any sort of tips. I posted a video yesterday. I've been doing so many sessions with so many, so many students. We have many groups. We had, um, yesterday we went on till about 10.30 at night and it was just all endocrine and a lot of clinical questions. Um, I've got a session, the combo course um, tomorrow. So that's from 7.30 to about 9.30. So pretty much every day we're either doing private sessions or we're doing the course that um, started about a week ago. So um, just to let you guys know, in the description, if you're new um, to the combo course or to pre-read shortcuts, then there is a link there if you want to get any more information about the combo course, or if you just want to speak to someone from our team. So we, you can do a free call as well. You're, you're very invited. If you just want to call us to ask more questions about the course, you could go on our website, book a free call, and uh, one member is going to give you a call and um, just chat to you. So. The floor is open to you, right? So if you have any questions, anything, just, just ask a question. So um, by the way, if you're dialing in, if you just want to put down where you're watching from, or if you're if you're a pre-reg student or training pharmacist, if you're doing the exam in November, so any anything, anything, I'll be happy to um, answer any of your questions. So while we um, wait for your questions, just a little bit about myself. I've been doing this for so many years. Um, Uma and myself founded Pre-Reg Shortcuts, which was basically an online um, training company. The whole idea why I put this company together was simply to facilitate a lot of work for training pharmacists during the foundation year, or what used to be the Pre-Reg year. So what we did was we did a lot of sessions, a lot of webinars, so interactive. Um, you can also click on the description if you want to look at some of the reviews about Pre-Reg Shortcuts. But this is a good opportunity where we could meet and greet and um, sort of engage with you. So we've got first question here from Lisa Rollinson. Lisa Rollinson, um, how are you, Lisa? Good to have you on. Thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate having you on, Lisa. Lisa is watching from Wallace. Any tips for the November exam? Right, so you're doing the exam in November. So I do a lot of sessions. Um, with. I've got private groups with so many students doing this exam in November. I will say to you, um, the main thing you want in terms of the tips is the first thing is that I'll do for you at this point, Lisa, is to build your confidence. When I talk about building your confidence, there are two parts of this exam. You have the first part, which is learning. So all the BNFs and the MAPs. So the first tip anyone can give you is make sure you go through your whole GPH framework. Make sure you do the reading OTC. You do your MEP and then your guidance, your NICE guidance, your CKS. All of this, right, Lisa, these, all these tools or all these resources are just um, literature. So that's the first part. But it's the second part, which is your mental preparation. I'm just going to ask a question, Lisa. Do you remember a time maybe when you're at university when you, you, um, you did some revision, you went into the exam, you read something before that exam, you went into the exam. While you were doing that exam, you forgot the stuff that you read the night before. And then it's only after you finish the exam, you walked and you said to yourself, oh my God, I can't believe I got that wrong. But I knew that stuff. I knew I had that experience. So this is the second part. That's your mental preparation. Because you know the stuff, but knowing is not enough. You could still know something and still fail in the exam or still get it wrong. So the two tips I'm going to give you, the first thing is you need to make sure that you've learned the stuff which is required for your exam. So your GPS framework, the core knowledge that you need to learn clinical calculations, right? In a nutshell, clinical calculation, OTC, MEP. That's the first part. The second part, which is the most important between now and because you're doing an exam in November, 
will be your mental state. When I talk about mental state, I'm talking about having that confidence. How do you build confidence? How do you build confidence? The way you build confidence is through repetition. Doing something over and over again is going to make you confident. So that's why at this stage you want to, if you have notes, rather than trying to learn new stuff that makes you even more nervous, you want to start looking at the things that you've already read, the notes that you've gone through already, start perfecting them, making yourself better, going through those past papers. It's all about past papers leading to your exam and just building that confidence. But you need to be very selective about the past papers you use. It's very important. I say this to all the students in the groups. We do a lot of questions. It has to be good quality questions. Good quality because there are many mocks out there that are so irrelevant today. So that might that be my tip for you, Lisa. Thanks for that question. Literally go through your um your core content, BNF. Um, now nice, obviously, I don't want to tell you to start learning now because you've got three weeks. I'm assuming that you already have your notes. You might be part of the combo course. Those on the combo course, we have all those notes for you. But Lisa, I'm gonna say go through your notes, but don't try to start learning new things, getting close to the exam. What you want to do is perfect what you already know. So it's going through that information again and again. And then the rest will be your mental state preparation. Watch some of my videos on YouTube. I always do motivational sessions. I did a motivational session, about three sessions um, before the exam in July. And I had many students that attended that session. Only the motivational sessions that we did for three days. And after the exam, I got so many emails saying how many things that came up that we covered came up in the exam. So definitely watch some of those videos, which were like the revision sessions just before the exam for the July, it applies to you as well. And um, hopefully that's gonna um, boost your confidence. Right, so again, more questions, what we've got? We've got Prince, Prince Flip. So Prince asking entries from November exam. So yes, yeah, so the same, the same thing I've just said to Lisa will be just going through repetition is the mother of all skill. That's why it really hurts me. If you watch the video, I posted a video yesterday and in that video, I said something which means a lot. You hear people talk about, leave your revision, don't start revising till December. Don't start your revision till January. But most of you know that it's still not enough. The earlier you start, the better, because it's all about repetition. The more time to go through something, the better you get. So it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like when you're doing, it's, if you ask me for instance, how do I get better at tennis? I'll say you've got to play more. How do I get better at anything? So how do, you, how do you get better, like confident, you know your stuff? There's only one secret. People try to make it so complex, but it's not. It's repetition. So the more you can go through stuff, the more you're going to retain information. That's why I always tell people start early. We started the combo course in October because I know the difference it can make. So for print, say for instance, if you started late, that's still not the end of the world. You still smash the exam. We have people that have joined the, joined the course about two months before the exam, one month before the exam started revising and they've done well. So in that case, if you're doing it towards the end, you've not had enough time to revise as much, you need to be very strategic in how you revise, which means that you need to really focus on the most important things. The first I'm gonna to say to you, the first six chapters of the BNF, make sure you master those ones, right? Your first six chapters of BNF, in a way, chapter one, GI, not as much, but take your high rating chapters, go through your framework. Go through your framework, look at, um, I'm just giving you guys like a quick summary now. If you said to me, Marvin, I've got like two weeks, I've not done any revision. Right now, Marvin, I'm really scared. I'll say to you, if you've got two weeks for the exam, it's already too late to start learning within two weeks. But if you had to do something that was really, really strategic right now, what I'll tell you to do is, number one, get onto that GPC website, look at that GPC framework. Take the high-weighting questions, right, the high-weighting chapters, cardiovascular, I call them the nice chapters. Right? If you guys in the combo course now, I call them the nice chapters. So N is for nervous system, I is for infections, C is for cardiovascular, E is for endocrine. Take those nice chapters, master your nice chapters, learn those ones, right? Master them. Then in your medium chapters, respiratory system. You want to go through those. This is what I do with private um, session students. Go through your respiratory system, but you've got to be very selective when you get to the second, um, when you get to the medium and the um, low weighting chapters. If you have a lot of time, I'm talking about someone who doesn't have much time. If you have a lot of time, you read everything, right? You try to build that confidence with all chapters. If you're short of time in your last days, then I'll say get into the medium waiting chapters, but don't read everything. I'll give you an example of some areas that come up in your exam. If you go into chapter seven, right? And this is from experience. I've analyzed so many past papers, right? So many, I've seen the GPC. I know where those questions come from. The hence, that's the reason why I help a lot of students succeed. So 
You, so now, if you say to yourself, fine, the nice chapters, master your nice chapters. There's no way around them. You've got to know them inside out because you have a lot of high-risk drugs there, anticoagulants, for instance, cardiovascular, your insulin, your, um, all of these are high-risk, right? Your CNS, your opioids are all high-risk. Take your methotrexate in, they're high-risk drugs. So go through your framework and get all those high-risk drugs first, okay? Then when you go into your, your, your medium chapter, right, your medium waiting, chapter seven, right, your genital urinary chapter. In that chapter, if you, if you analyze the questions, you get more questions on contraception. So if I had to go into chapter seven, rather than trying to read the whole thing, like you're trying to read everything on genital urinary, you're trying to read everything on abortion and all of those. Yes, but if you're short of time, jump into contraception, EHC, learn that stuff, right? Because these are common things. The GPS is going to ask you um, common questions, right? Because common things are common in your exam, right? Common things are common. So counseling with your EHC, how much counseling do you know about Uniprista? Can you give it to um, breastfeeding ladies? Right. Which one is more effective, Levonel or Uniprista? Which one is more effective? What counseling advice do you give to a patient that vomits? Right. If you have any, if you take the tablet and you vomit, how many hours between can do they have to take another one? What sort of um, if a lady comes to a pharmacy, these are all potential questions that are very practical, not just about your exams, but as a pharmacist. So I'm just giving parts from that area. So someone says to you, they come to a pharmacy, a lady takes contraception, she comes in for the morning after pill and she asks you, okay, I'm going to take this morning after pill now. But um, what happens to my normal pill? How long do I give it? Do I take it straight away? Do I continue taking my normal pill? Because I'm going to take the EHC now. Then what about my normal pill? When do I start? So you need to know, okay, if it's Uniprestal, it's different. Normally, Levonel will be straight away. Uniprestal, you're looking at five days. So there's all this stuff, but all of this stuff is on your EHC because you know more questions will come from there. If I jump into the GI, for instance, this is if you don't have much time, we're going to the GI. From analysis, most of the questions I'll tell you right now when it comes to the GI system, constipation, right? Constipation, red flags, right? So the first thing is constipation. Make sure that you learn your constipation properly, right? So I'm giving you like, I'm giving you strategic learning. I'm giving you strategic learning in your last days. So you jump into your GI system, look at constipation, guys, because constipation, you get questions on constipation. You also have like MHRA updates such as with Senna, which was sort of more recently with the pack sizes. So the asking questions on constipation is more, is more common. The second area where they generally ask questions in the GI system, they're looking at PPIs. Don't talk about PPIs, talk about um, H. pylori, omeprazole, like asking questions on those. Know about all the, um, all the qualities, all the things about the PPIs, hypomagnesemia, and things like that, right? GI um, side effects, everything. Learn everything you can about your PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. They ask questions from there. Another area where they potentially ask questions are your amino salicylates. And that's a lot to do with like, your red blood cells, the side effects, monitoring. So that's from um, the GI, right? Then another place, then you move on to your cytotoxics. You always get questions on cytotoxics. And some of them are so straightforward. You guys know those questions, right? You know the questions they always give about being Christian and being blasting and, and, and what method, what method do you give them? What is it intrathecal? Is it IV? Those ones always come up. But um, cytotoxics are a small chapter, but it'll generally ask questions from there. And then also, another thing you need to remember in your high risk drugs, if you go into your GPH framework, you're going to notice that most of your high-risk drugs are groups of drugs. For instance, antihypertensives, groups, ACE inhibitors, all of those, opioids, groups of many drugs, right? Um, you go to your anticoagulants. So you look at your anticoagulants, your DOAX, the direct acting oral anticoagulants. You look at um, your heparins. So those are groups, but there are very few drugs where it's just that drug on its own, and that's methotrexate. So you look at methotrexate, it stands out. It is a cytotoxic. That is one drug that comes up a lot. So you're going to spend more time rather than learning everything on the cytotoxic chapter. Make sure you've, read, you've learned about methotrexate inside out. Right. So I'm just giving you tips here and there. So that's what you want to do. So master your nice chapters in these last days. Go through your medium rating ones. Be very strategic about the medium rating ones. And then your low, low rating here and there, right? I don't need to force too much about your low rating, but if you're in your final days, you want to master those, right? Your high rating and your medium ones, the need a strategic with the medium ones. Then another thing I'm going to tell you, another thing, tip I'm going to give you, there are so many past papers, but past papers can be very misleading. Past papers are not designed um, in line with the GPC framework. I don't, I, I don't believe that. There might be some 
um, mock papers that maybe, yes, coincidence, it was similar. These questions were in this mock and that appeared in the exam. Most people talk about Bradford and different things that are more similar to the exam. Yes, they could be similar, but it's most times a hit and miss. It could be similar in July, but the same mock by the same company in the November exam is completely different. But the one thing I'm going to give you and I'm going to advise you to help you is that the first things, thing you want to answer are the GPHC questions. Right? I know that they have this in the groups, on the Telegram groups, you have all those links, but there's a number of students that compiled most of the questions that came in the GPH exam. So these are actual GPHC questions that come in the exam. Right? You have like a collection from about 2017, that's for clinical, from like 2017 to, um, to, to recently July, right? Those are the first ones that you want to answer. You want to go through those questions. The reason why you want to go through those questions because those questions have actually come up in the exam. So this is the mindset of the GPHC. When you, I used to set mock papers, and when, you, and when we set mock papers, the aim is to make them hard, make them harder than the actual exam with the belief that if you can pass this mock, if you can get even 70% in this mock, then you're likely to get 80% in the GPH exam. So most of these mocks, uh, um, harder, right, than the actual exam, or the, or the questions are just not good quality. So you need to understand the dynamics that these mocks that you're doing. So I have so many students that come to me for coaching, that come to me for like advice, even in my groups. My groups, there's so many. I've got probably my one-to-ones and private groups, about 50 students. And I work with each of them personally, so connected with each of them. And um, one thing that always come is that many people, right? Many, many, many students at this stage is, you just need to have more confidence because these questions, generally, you the way our brains work, that's why I do a mental session. The way the brain works is that we tend to focus more on the things that we get wrong, the hardest things. So when you're in that Telegram group or those WhatsApp groups, what sort of questions do you post in those groups? Do you post normal questions? Do you post easy questions? No, the questions that students put up are the hard ones, the complex ones that are breaking your brain. So if you're, if you're sitting down there with your phone, you're trying to study, you see this question on Telegram group that someone has posted, I'm trying to do this. You're like, gosh, I can't do that. Another person posts the next one. Oh, I cannot do this one as well. Another person posts the third one. And you go, oh my gosh, I can't do this one as well. It kills your confidence. It kills your confidence. But most of the time, out of 120 questions, out of 120 questions, there might be about five difficult questions in that exam, like really, really tough. But what happens to the other 115 questions? No one talks about them. You don't think about them. Even when you do a past paper, you do 120 questions, you're going to be cracking your head on the 10 questions that you failed. Those are the ones that you'll be thinking about. Oh my gosh, I'm going to fail because I, I got 10 questions wrong. But hey, hang on a minute. What about 110 questions that you got right? So this is all about mental state. That's why in the final days of the exam, I normally do motivational sessions, which is really just about boosting your confidence. But those are tips that I can give you. Um, what we've got, Masuda. How are you, Masuda? I'm watching from London. November tips, so that's for you as well, Masuda. A lot of November tips, right? Hi, all. Nice to be here. Maz from Dublin. How are you, Maz? Maz, are you doing the exam in November? Are you a um, trainee pharmacist? Really good to have you on from Dublin. Mina says, uh, will the November exam be any more difficult or different to the July exam? Very good question. I like that question because I get it all the time. And I'm going to answer this question. I'm going to tell you guys the truth about this question. It's a common question. I have analyzed a lot. I'm someone that spends a lot of time analyzing stuff. And all of those that are on the combo course, they will tell you. I always say this to, um, to all the students on the course. I don't want anyone giving me an answer to a question and telling me that the source is my tutor or the source is, I heard it from somewhere or my, my university professor told me this. I don't want those kind of, because that's not confidence. Confidence is coming from the textbook, right? So if you're going to tell me something, if you're going to say something, I want you to tell me, I read this in here. I've got my source, either the BNF or the NICE guidelines. So have the source. You need to have solid um, backup for what you say. So many students will say, oh, yeah, this is, this, this is what happens. This is what you do with this. Oh, yeah, I think I heard this from somewhere. Somebody told me, or I read this in a certain course, or Marvin's notes, or I don't know, some other notes, Buttercup's notes. Don't be that sort of pharmacist. Don't be that sort of, be the sort of student that you could say you know where it is in the BNF. 
So if anybody tells you guys anything, like a tutor, like a local, like a pharmacist, nice, right? You've got to thank them for giving that information. But at the same time, make sure that they can show you that information in the source, right? If you cannot show me that in the BNF or in NICE or guideline like that, then I'm sorry. Don't take it. Don't just learn things like that. So this specific question, people say this. You hear many people say, oh, the November exam is harder than the July exam. The November exam is harder. Where is the evidence? Now, this is it. It is true that you have a higher pass rate in the summer, okay? So, Minas, it is true. If you ask me this question differently, if you ask me, do you have a higher um, pass rate in the summer than in November? I will tell you yes. Because if you, look at, if you look at the statistics, ever since this exam started, since exam started, students have had above 71% pass rate in the summer. It's always been above 71, 72% pass rate, never been below which is quite interesting for you to have more confidence that more students pass this exam than fail the exam. But in the summer, and I'm going back to this, right back to start the exam, even 10 years, how, how, how many years this started, but um, you've always had more than 70% pass rates. In November, it's been a mix of both. You've had lower pass rates in November. But now this is the question. Is the reason why we're having a lower pass rate in November because the exam is di more difficult? You've got to be very careful with that question. Anyone that assumes that that's the reason, the reason why we have a lower pass rate in November than in the summer is because the exam is more difficult. That's where I have a very big question mark because you will have to then show me the evidence for that. But one thing I'm going to tell you in terms of evidence, if you look, right, one of the reasons why you have less students doing um, a lower pass mark in November, and if you don't believe me, you can look at it yourself. That's why I do the sessions with you right now. If you look, I've been doing this for many years. The exam in November, you have more support. You have more students doing the exam in November, and sorry, in, uh, in July. Right? So in July, you might have about 3,000 students or what doing the exam. There is a buzz everywhere. The revision sessions are intense. Even training providers, most training providers advertise and they're doing all sorts of training days and training courses between January to like April or May. What happens after that? What happens after the exam in July? Look at what happens. Even I've got, I've got a Telegram group and in our Telegram group, we have over 500 students. And you see a difference between the buzz around studying in July because there's more students, there's more training, there's more past papers, there's so much going on to support you, to support you, to support you. But those doing the exam in November, it's very less. You might hear uh, uh, those training providers that were doing training days and inviting all the students to come and do training days. In November, they might say, oh, listen, we've got a mock. We're going to sell you a mock. You can try this mock. That's it. So one of the key reasons in terms of the stats, in terms of the stats, not just me guessing, in terms of the statistics, it shows that the students in November get less. It's more like there's less support compared to those in July. There's always less. So that's why I do these sessions. I'll do the sessions because I think, okay, fine. I know there are still people in November and I'm going to be honest. And it's still not even as intense with the November students like it was in July because of the numbers. Okay, so, and also I've analyzed the reason why many students fail. Because every time students fail, they send me loads of emails. I've been doing this for so many years. And I'm going to tell you the truth. Even now in my, in my private groups, I've got about 50 students. There are a number of students that have failed a number of times. I'm going to have a session. Please, guys, don't miss the session, especially those of you doing the exam. I'm going to bring someone on here on Tuesday. You guys must have seen me um, put the poster out. And I'm bringing this girl that failed the exam three times. She took this exam four times. It's very rare that you see someone that's done the GPS exam four times. Uh, how many of you know anyone? Like, most of the time, it's three times, right? Maximum. She did four times. She passed the fourth attempt. And she is so inspirational. You need to come and listen to what she says. I was blown away. I, I was totally blown away. And that's why I'm bringing her to you guys. So I'll give you, that's my way of helping you. Because I know there's many of you doing in November, but who's helping those doing in November? Right? Who's, who's, who's out there coming out in November? Come and, come and watch this. We're going to do free sessions. We're going to do revision sessions. We're just going to do all of this for you. It's not as intense like the, the ones in July. So that's why I'm doing the sessions for you, just to help out, just to bring people in, to motivate you. And when that happens, 
you'll be doing well. The reason now with why many students fail when I speak to them, when they speak to me, majority of the time is not to do with more of the difficulty of the exam. It's not like the exam was so difficult that's what I felt. If you look at the reasons, I'm talking about majority of the reasons, the two different factors. I'll tell you what they are when they send a message. Number one, I did not have a good privilege. Yeah? My privilege year wasn't good. My tutor wasn't supportive. The team wasn't supportive. I had personal issues. I wasn't well. I went through some family issues. Most of them, or I just did not revise on time. I left things to the last minute. Because every time all these students come to me for the second attempt, for the third attempt, one of the questions I always ask, always, that's where I start with everything is, what did you get in the last exam? And then tell me the reasons why you think you failed the exam. The reason why I say that, because doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results in linguistic terms, that person is considered a fool or insane. You cannot keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. In order to change the results, you need to change what you do. So I always ask them, anyone I'm working with one-to-one -one in the group, is if you fill that exam, what are the reasons or the reason why you think you fill that exam? And out of about 100 students, and I'm telling you from the truth from the bottom of my heart, only about probably 90, uh, only about 5% will say to me, oh, I found it really difficult. The rest of the 95%, what they say to me is, Marvin, I didn't really study on time. I started a bit too late. I had some family issues going on. Right? My tutor, my pre reg year was terrible. And then this is the worst, right? Most of them that even failed the exam failed by one or two marks. Many people that failed the exam, even out of all those that we talk about failing, when you, when you ask them, I don't know, is there anyone here that's failed the exam that is doing again? If you're doing the, the exam again, you can just put down how many marks were you off by. Many of the students are not off by many marks. It's not like it was so difficult that all of a sudden, boom, I fell by so many marks. You speak to most people, I fell by one mark, by two marks, by three marks. So you're also intelligent, but it's just one or two things. And then if you give them the same paper again later, that's a question I ask you. Like, do you remember times at university where you've gone into an exam, you've done, done the question, and then you've come out of the exam and thought, oh my God, I got it wrong, but I actually knew that stuff. You don't walk away saying that was hard, what, do, do you? You go away saying, oh, I don't know what happened to me. So let's see, we've got Maghribia. If you guys think, I know that like everything I say, I always have evidence for. That's why I always ask you guys, just tell me. So I'll show you. I've got Maghribia says she failed by two marks. Two marks. Now I can tell you guys 100%, even without knowing him or her, right? I can tell you 100% that there must have been some questions in that exam that Maghribia, that you would have failed, but you actually knew the stuff. Either it was perhaps you misread something or it was your state of your mind or the mind of the stress or sometimes maybe you don't even complete all the questions, run out of time. But when you took the, if you take that paper again and you went through it, you're going to get more things correct now. You're going to have the aha moment. Right? You're going to have, ah, oh, yeah, true. So most of the time, the reasons why we fail, it's not because, it's simply because most of the time, it's maybe the way it was worded, I did not really get this, Marvin. That's why when people come to me, I always say to all of you, all of you have done the exam and failed, I don't think you failed. I don't look at it like a failure because you're all so smart. And I know that the reason why you fail is not because it's not because you don't know stuff. Hence the reason why I spent at least a week before the exam doing the mental stuff. If I didn't think that was important, I wouldn't be bored of do, doing it. But I know that the reason why people fail is not because you don't know stuff. I've got Minas filled by one mark on calculations. One mark on calculations. Right? Many people that failed the exam. So don't get what when people see people say they failed the exam. It's not like they failed by lows. Like I was, wow, this was so difficult. I failed by so many questions, Marvin. I did all my best. I studied so hard. I did everything. There was nothing else I can do. And I felt so badly. Very rare. You might have one or two people that might say that. But most of them are like, no, they'll tell you I know where I went wrong. Oh gosh, even when I do private sessions with students, um, I ask them questions and then they give me the answers. Most of the time, many people change their answers. Like you give the answer and then later when you read the question, or I might say something and you go, oh yeah, Marvin, can I change that? Can I change that answer now? Can I change that answer? So we know the stuff, but we need to build that confidence a few days before the exam because you're also smart, you're also intelligent. And the reason why I know that is because you've passed your university degree. That is a hard degree. So the fact that you've, you've gone through that exam, you gone through the years at university and you've you've actually qualified, right? You've got your master's degree. That in itself shows that you have what it takes. 
Your question is never been a question of capability. It's never been a question of whether you're capable of passing that exam. It's always been a question of motivation. So it's not, can you pass the period exam? It's, will you pass the period exam? But right? it's not, can you, it's will you? And when I talk about will you, it's a matter of motivation. How motivated are you to put the work in and do the work and keep going? If you can do that, you're gonna pass the exam. Because if you do not have that capability, you wouldn't have graduated the first, first uh, you have gotten away from university. And the second thing, your tutor wouldn't put you forward for the exam if you do not um, have the, the capacity. You've gone through all the um, you've gone through all the work, right? You've done all the work, you've done all the competencies. So even for a tutor to say, fine, you can sit the exam, it's acknowledgement that you have what it takes to pass the exam. All right, so it's never been a question of this exam is so difficult, oh my gosh, and all of this stuff. It's really, and once you're well prepared, it doesn't matter. I did my exam in November. I took the exam in November. It doesn't matter whether it's November or whether it's July or whether it's June. The main thing you want to focus is, am I well prepared? Don't worry about how difficult it's going to be or how easy it's going to be. Ask yourself, how prepared are you? And if you're prepared for this exam, it doesn't matter. Maybe that in November or they give you in July. You're going to smash the exam. It's just the way it is. So what we got, we've got... um. Asuda. By the way, thank you all of you for joining in. I'd like to give people special shout outs. Prince, shout out to you. Mina, shout out to you. Boy, I've got my boy Kami. Man like Kami. So good to see you on the Kami. Oh, I love Kami. Kami, Kami. I miss you, Kami. I miss you. I need to have Kami. I need to give you a call. We need to um catch up a little bit. <laughs> what a lad. What a top lad. Um, Minas, how are you? Maze, Magriba, Rihanna. How are you, Rihanna? Kaysil, got my grieve already. Great, great, great to see all of you on there. Thanks for joining and thanks for interacting, asking those questions. Let me see who else got a question. Um, whose question have I got? I don't want to miss anyone's question. Um, so I've answered that question for Mina. So it was about the exam will be difficult than the dry exam. So don't worry about that, Mina. The question you should be asking yourself is, are you going to be prepared? As long as you're prepared, don't matter. It doesn't matter. Would there be any more motivational sessions or revision sessions prior to the November exam? Finally, July ones, very useful. So thank you for mentioning that. So I've got someone that attended um, the motivational sessions and found that very useful. So um, personally, I want to do something for you guys. Obviously, it's so busy for me right now. Like anyone knows me knows that, gosh, it's like so many sessions, like throughout the whole week. So I like to do them in the evenings. But almost every evening, I've got the private groups, I've got the um, the combo course every evening. But I'm but I am planning on doing one for you. I am definitely planning on doing one. So um yeah yeah I don't want I don't want to let you guys down. You know I think I think you deserve it to be honest. So I'm going to find some time and have the motivational session. If not if I can't do that, then the only advice I have to give you is to watch those videos. Okay, because it's still the same thing and the same content. You can learn a lot from there. But I know it'd be nice to have it more interactive for myself. But um, I'll look into it. I'll look into it. If I can get some time, definitely I'd like to do that for you guys again. May says, if you can share some info and updates on the BNF 81 and 82 for November exams. So I have to look into the updates. So you have a few updates. Um, actually, yes, there's a few updates, but not many updates. So the first thing I want to say to you is don't panic. I know people do that. People really panic, like, oh my gosh, BNF has changed. So I did the previous change for the previous BNF. I was meant to post a video for the new changes in this BNF, in um, BNF 82. 82. I've not posted that yet. There are not many changes. There are not many changes. So Mass asked that question. I could do one for you guys. I could do one because I really wanted to do one um, for the changes in the BNF. There are not many, but uh, let me just show you something that you can do now before you even post a video. In your BNF, on um, what page is it? Um, you always have in the BNF at the beginning, it talks about the changes, all right? So most of those changes we go through and you have changes all the time, right? Especially that's why you want to use the electronic BNF. The changes don't really have as many changes, guys, to be honest, don't get scared or anything. Or let that pull yourself up. But if you went to your BNF, in the front of the BNF, you have a part in the BNF that talks about the changes. Most of the changes are things that you don't even do, dispense but you see that there are a few on there that are important. So it's page, what's that? Roman numerals 516. Yeah, so XVI, right? Your number, so those of you that got page um, 82. So this is something you can do. I'll show you the easiest way. So 
But anyone asking me this question, Marvin, can you go through the updates on the BNF? There were so many, right? So last time when I did the video, it was more like I'm trying to focus on the most important. Because if you look on here, you see all sorts of drugs, lots of antiviral drugs and things that have nothing to do with the exam. However, you've got something here, for instance, levaglutide, page 742, for the managing of overweight and obesity, the NICE guidance. Levaglutide is a common drug that's coming up more and more, right? So um, that's definitely something you have to look into. So I'll say, um, to answer that question, Mace, Mas, how do you pronounce your name? Um, there are not so many changes, but I'll just advise you to just go to those changes. You have the changes in your BNF under the first two pages. What you want to do, just go through the common drugs. So look at the common drugs and underline them, those that are especially your high rating chapters. We've got something here on quinolones. You know you have a lot of C, um, CSM advice and MHRA on quinolones. Quinolones are so important, so your ciprofloxacins. There's one quinolone that most people don't know is a quinolone, it's your nalidixic acid, because it doesn't sound like ciprofloxacin and ofloxacin. But quinolones, definitely those MHRA advice on quinolones so important. You know, you're looking at things like epilepsy, right? It could trigger epilepsy if you sell an NSAID to someone on a quinolone. That could cause a, a seizure, regardless of whether they're epileptic or not. So these are the sort of um, things, tendon damage, rupture, um, QT interval, prolongation. So these are all um, your MHRA warnings, but these are the most important ones that you want to learn. So there is something on quinolones, and it talks about small risk of heart valve regurgitation, consider other therapeutic options. So these are the areas that you want to underline. But rather than go through every single thing, just look at your common drugs, because there's many drugs and vaccines and things in there that you don't need. Just look at the common drugs. I could, if I had more time, I would just highlight them for you. I could literally go through this list. I've got erythromycin. So there was an update on erythromycin. So um, definitely, you guys know previously, we had the PEC-C, most of you know now. Because before um, with pregnancy, the advice, the safe ones that we used to use erythromycin, it used to say um, not known to be harmful in pregnancy. But um, recently, that guidance has been updated. And now it says... Only use it if the benefit outweighs the risk. So there are just little things like that definitely just need to be aware of, but the changes are not as much. So my advice to you just go, go quickly through this, go through your most important drugs, especially your high risk ones, and see if there's any high risk drugs in there, and then look at that change. Okay, Miles, so that answers that question for you. If I get time, which would be great, I could probably do a video just highlighting those for you. So my good beer says calculations will be getting tested on powders questions. Is it still on the phone? I don't think so. So I don't do calculations. Uma does calculations is excellent. That's his area. But um, powder questions, can someone answer that question? I bet most of you know. I don't I don't think so. But um, I don't know. I don't know with calculations. I'm I'm the clinical guy, but I can definitely get the answer for you. Definitely. So let's just see. Does anyone know? Um, does anyone know the answer to this question? We get tested on powder questions. So you guys, some of you in November, you can answer that question. If not, um, I could find that out for you. Um, in, in the description in this video, you have different links. I think you also have our email, which is um, gpcourse at gmail.com. You can also email us after this session if you want to ask any questions, or you can also um, go on our website and book a free call um, if you have any questions about, say, enrolling on the combo course. Um, KCL says, what mock papers would you recommend us to try? So um, Casey, I just spoke about that. That is one area that I really cannot, I cannot talk about mocks because again, I don't think there is one mock out there that is consistent. This is the one. And also I don't want to be seen to be endorsing different mocks because that's not really the case. But I can tell you what I hear from students generally. Okay, what I hear from the students that um, I do private sessions with one-to-one. -one. I can tell you the ones that they say, but that doesn't mean anything. And that doesn't mean I'm giving it a stamp of approval or anything. It's just one of those things you hear students saying. How true is it? I don't know. But you hear people talk about Bradford, right? Even when I was doing my exam, the Bradford mark is similar to the exam. You also meet many people that tell you, um, not really, right? But Bradford mark is what people talk about. Um, pro Farmers, I think Pro Farmers, um they had a mock one that was similar to exam. People mentioned about pro farmers, which was good. So that was good. But um, I don't know. Right? That's, that's not me recommending this. This is just what I'm hearing students have said. But you always have contracting views because one student might say, yes, yes, it was um, the Bradford mock is really good. Another person said, no, I didn't find it good. So, but the ones that I've heard, Bradford, I've heard about pro farmers. I've heard um, someone recently was talking about, about Keele University. 
the Kiel, Kiel University um, mocks were good, similar to the exam. There was um, something with Buttercup. But um, to be honest, those are the ones. But I tell everyone this, those on Telegram group, and I say this to everyone, the questions you want to focus on first are those questions from the GPT exam that were compiled together, right? That actually come up in the exam. Because now what's happening is the GPHC is repeating questions, right? So when I was doing this session with the students in, in, in March, they did it. And then those in July, we're going through the motivational sessions. I was still saying the same thing. Go through that compilation of GPHC questions because these guys are repeating questions. So they may repeat it, they may not repeat it, but you don't want to be in a situation where you see a question that came up in the previous exam and you have that with you and not even look at it. And then all of a sudden it's come up again. Right? It might not even come up the same words, obviously. It might be changed around in terms of the wording, but the concept is still the same. So the only thing that I recommend, especially at this stage, is those GPHC questions because you know they've come up. Right? So they're not exact. They're not papers. It's just people's stories and recounts of what questions came up in the exam. But it gives you at least a proper indication. Apart from that, all the other mocks recommending hit and miss. Personally, for me, it's a hit and miss. And then the many poor mocks out there, the many bad mocks out there, like the questions are ridiculous. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even get you to stress yourself out with um with some of those mocks. Even the answers are, are strange answers. They're not um what were they ambiguous? And sometimes people don't even explain the answers in detail. I had a student. I'm not going to name any groups and any providers because that's not what I'm about. Right? I'm not about saying different things about different people. But um, I had a student that I was training, and she'd been to one of these mocks, one of these providers, and she said, yes, they give, gave us the answers, but with no explanations. And even when I used to ask them, what was the explanation for this? They just tell me that's the answer. So it wasn't even understanding like the concepts of things. So I'm not really one to tell you this mock. I will encourage you to do as many questions as possible. Do as many papers. Um, test yourself. Another one people talk about on track, on track RPS, right? So the on track is another one that students talk about the use. Um, I'll give uh, okay. I'll give you things that students say on track. So they do those questions. Some people do those questions and do well. Um, in terms of questions, people talk about farm educate, right? So farm educate. I don't know. I'm not really versed with them. I have seen stuff from farm educate and it looks good. Like I've seen some of the quality of the notes with students sharing here and there. I've seen like yes, it looks like you no know, good notes. Some people say they need to update the notes. I don't know, right? I don't know nothing about the companies. All these companies, respect to all of them. But um, this is what students say, right? So Farm Educate, but very positive things from Farm Educate. So I don't know if they have a mock. Perhaps I have a mock that might be something that then up, I guess it should be the same. If the notes are good, I'm hoping the mock will be good as well. I look at different sites. Um, someone told me about pre -Reg Master. I haven't seen the app. I haven't used the app. But pre -Reg Master seems to be what a number of students say to me. Oh, pre -Reg Master is quite good. They got a lot of questions. I don't even know whether it's only clinical or calculations. But pre -Reg Master... But clinical one that I've seen that I follow, but I don't follow too many people and stuff. But on Instagram, this are uh, the flashcard pharmacist, right? The flashcard farm not endorsing the stuff either. But um, I have seen some of their flashcards and they quite look quite nice. They're like quite good, they're colorful. And I think, yes, that's a very good like sort of um social media um platform where it would be good, especially at this time of your revision, where you don't want to read stuff, you want flashcards. If you don't know about the flashcard pharmacies, um, I've seen the stuff and I think it looks good. But someone else might think no. But so that's it. That, that's really it. But the main thing is the source, your main books, go through your main books, look at those GPC questions. Those are the only questions that personally, to me, that's what I'm going to use to like assess your levels. Um, let's see. Mohammed Osman, how are you, Mohammed? Do you guys do the course twice a year? If so, when you start. So um, over the past years, we've done it twice a year. But we never know about the second course. It all depends on our um, on demand. So luckily, each year we've had after we've done the October course, we've had a huge demand still, and then we've gone on and done the course in February. This year, I don't know. The, based on the demand, if we don't get that sort of demand, now we have a hundred and something on the October course. If we don't get the sort of numbers um, for the course, then we might just end up. It might be an automated course. So it wouldn't be a live course. The live course, you get the best from a live course because we can interact like this. It might just be an automated course where it's not live. It's literally this live course. Then you could buy the live course as automated videos. All right? So we don't have any guarantee yet whether we're going to do it. I can't say to you we're going to do it in February because I don't know. 
We're going to see what the students want, what you guys want. If in, if in February we have a high demand, like in October, we've had a very high demand in October, and that's why the course is like so good and so packed and so many people. But um, if we get the same numbers in, in February, then we will do one. If we don't, then we'll probably just do as an automated way, just watch the videos. Right, what we've got, Lisa. So anyone doesn't know about period shortcuts, we've got reviews down in the description. You can look at the reviews. Um, Lisa says, I'm currently going through the videos on the combo course. Oh, Lisa, you're on the combo course, fantastic. Um, making better notes, how do you rate on track questions? Also, can I be added to any of the private groups? So again, Lisa, unfortunately, as I said, I don't I don't rate um different um training for um training providers. It's just out of decency, you know, we're all professionals and I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to come here and talk about another company. I can only talk about my company and what I do and I, and I, and I like things that way. Um, I could give you general things. So on track, I could talk about on track. I hear mixed reviews about on track. It doesn't mean anything like this is just me, but it doesn't mean anything. Some students say it's good and I've had other students tell me that it's not. Now, when I did my pre-reg, I used on track and I found it useful. Right, so if you ask me, Marvin, about on track, but I did my privilege a long time ago. So I had hard that find on track when I did my privilege, I found it all right. So I use on track, I found some hard and everything. But now, when I speak to students, I'll tell you the truth, I get mixed reviews. So some students say, Why is really good? I liked on track, I use on track. Others say, No, I'm not really sure about the questions. So, um, that's all I can tell you. I don't, I don't, I don't know. If there's anyone else that uses on track here, then they can see how they'll find it. But I generally say questions are good. Like you always have to have good quality questions. My only problem is, okay, let me let me put it this way: the more questions you do, the better. I, I'm I'm all for doing questions, like calculations. How do you get better calculations? You do more calculations. How do you get better clinical? You you revise more. You read, you just go through this stuff as many times as possible. So in that case, if you ask me about questions. All questions are good. Right? All questions are good to practice because they're going to help you your confidence. But my problem is when a question is killing your confidence. My problem is when you're doing something and that thing is making you feel it's so difficult or it's just so out of date and it makes you stress and you think you're not good enough because of this. That's what I have, that's what I have a problem with, those sort of questions. So answer as many questions as possible. There are some good um, textbooks, pharmaceutical calculations. There are good books out there that can help. And... Um, in terms of different providers, I encourage people to find out for yourself. I'm not, I'm, I'm not one to sit down here and go slit any company. People do that, which I think is ridiculous. Like, like, like really, <laughs> you know, like really you're gonna sit here and you're gonna be like, like slitting a different private company. No, what I say is you find out for yourself. People come to the course, the combo course, I encourage them to go to other courses. This is the thing that's funny, right? When people come to me and go, Marvin, private short course, I'm, I'm, I'm like, good, right? Try other courses as well, because that's the only way you can know stuff. Try. How do you know this course is good or this course is bad? You just gotta try it. <laughs> People can say whatever they like. At the end of the day, you have to try it to know. All right. So you speak to people. You see what they say. How do I know my course is good? The pre of course course is good, because people say it's good. But there are some people that might say, "Oh, it's rubbish." All right. So, but it's right. Everyone's entitled to opinion. If someone asks me, I will say it's good because it's my course and I put in so much effort. And I can see all the reviews. That's why I share the reviews for people to see the reviews from students. But at the end of the day, you can find out for yourself. You have to find out for yourself. Um, Rihanna. Okay, another question. Lisa's asking, how do we join the private groups? Um, the private groups started a while ago. So these were students on the combo course like yourself. So the private groups are more like um the, the analogy that I give everyone is that think about when you're at university, you had your lecture theaters. Right, you had to go for your lectures. So in your lectures, that was just information given to you, wasn't it? Like info, 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 info. But having information is not enough until you start doing past papers. <laughs> you can you can go through this whole BNF, right? Is, 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 am I right or wrong? Right, you could read this BNF so many times, and then you think you know your stuff until you start doing past papers. You're like, oh my god, I don't even feel like I've read the chapter. So that's what the private groups are about. It's all practical. So you think about your lecture theater, which is lectures. That's like a combo course. We give you all the good information, the content for you to learn. And then once, if you have aspirin, when you go to a lecture theater and you had to make aspirin, you can learn how to make aspirin in that lecture, but you still know how to make aspirin until you get to the lab, right? So you can know the theory of making aspirin, 
But when you go to the lab, you work in smaller groups in your labs than you, in your labs in the, in the university. It's a smaller group, and then you have someone like an invigilator or a tutor looking out for you guys. You kind of have a big group there because it's small because you're actually doing the practicals. And then when you make the aspirin, then that's it. You know the stuff. You have the knowledge. You've put into practice. Now I can say you know how to make aspirin. So the private group is like the lab for us. So the combo course is like the lecture theater. We give you all the notes. But those in the private groups, we only do questions. It's a practical. We're going through practical questions and questions, hundreds and hundreds of questions, scenarios, putting all that knowledge into practice, building that confidence so that in the actual exam you're fine. But now it's really too late because that started about two and a half months ago because we have a very long program that we follow every week. So now we're like at the end of it. So we had about 20 sessions. So um, yes, it's quite, it's quite a, a detailed sort of program. But this is obviously finishing now. Those students that are going to start the exam in October, they'll be able to do it um, after the combo course in January, February when they finish. Um, what Rihanna says, how do we know if a paper truly reflects what will be tested? I feel like some of them ask very difficult questions. No one is going to be able to ask, no one's going to be able to answer that question. Right? But the only way that you know what it truly reflects is by knowing what the actual questions are in the exam. So my question to you would be, where do you find actual questions? That's what I said, and that's why I keep saying, personally, those GPHC questions that come that have been compiled in this Telegram group, the GPT questions 2017, 2018, those are the ones that I look at more, right? Even though it might not be as accurate because whoever has put that down, the questions still might not be as accurate as the exam, but at least it is a closer reflection of what came up in the exam. So how do you know whether a paper truly reflects uh, what will be tested in the exam? You have to do those questions, first of all. You have to have like some sort of GPHC style questions you can see that the gpc gives also some questions that just the style that they're gonna ask the questions in the rest will be um really you could also see that concepts in calculations for instance remain concepts don't matter if you learn how to do dilution questions if you know the concepts on how to solve dilution questions you have many different questions you'll still be able to answer them so the only way you know about the quality paper people wouldn't know until they say to you try to look at more recent mock papers because there are so many mock papers in those groups that came from so many years ago. We had to look at the most recent, when I say the most recent, like in the last two, 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 two years, really, all right? Try to look at the mocks that were done in the last two years. And that's the assumption that most training providers would try to at least, that's the assumption, <laughs> try to make the, the, the questions more modern with the changes in the exam. But that's the only thing, is the only way you could do that, try to do more recent questions, um, look for a good provider, that you hear a lot of good things about. So if you have a, a provider that has a good reputation, that has a good pass rate, then perhaps there are things that you might look at. Although pass rates are a bit funny because pa pass rates don't mean much. First of all, there are many companies that lie about the pass rates. They talk nonsense, like 100%, 100% pass rate. Like, I don't know, like even, even when we give pass rates, because students ask for pass rates, because you want to know, but it's not really an accurate measure because Say, for instance, Rihanna, for instance, many students do different, different mocks or different courses in the year. Most people don't just stick to one course. So even those in the combo course be like, yes, I was also on Farm Educate or my company, um, Lloyd or something, also gave us in-house. Many people are like, what do you call them? They're flirts. Right? We're all like flirts. Right? We're like flirts when it comes to training. So most of us might do maybe two or three different courses. So when, when you pass at the end, who takes the credit? Like, you know what I mean? And then when you fail, who is responsible for you failing? So I'll just say, you need to know which companies, from your experience, you need to try stuff. If there's a company that you've heard about, you could read the reviews, they seem to be good. You've spoken to some people, they've said some good things about this company. You can try the questions yourself. You could go to that company, try the papers, see what they do. And if it's genuinely a company that cares about students, and that's always updating the stuff, and that is like really good, then there's a likely chance that the past papers should at least reflect, should be close to what the GPS is looking for. Okay, so um, what drugs are we required to know, specific dosing? Is it just some of the high-risk drugs or literally all of them? <laughs> I always get this question as well. 
I'd like you to answer that question yourself. The last part of that question, literally all of them, do you honestly think there's anybody out there, any pharmacist or even those newly qualified, do you honestly think that there's any of them that knows all the side effects and the dosing of all the drugs in the BNF? If there's anyone that knows all the dosing of all the drugs in here, that person needs to be murdered, right? That person, because that person is an alien, that person is dangerous to the planet. If I see anyone that says, I know all the doses, honestly, we need to check you because you are not human. You are different. You are something else. It's impossible. So you've answered that question already. Part of it is you want to know your most common drugs. You're starting with the high-risk drugs. So in terms of your dosing, definitely your high-risk drugs. I'll give you examples. I'll give you examples. Just out of my, my head, I'll give you examples. So out of the combo course, you're on the combo course, and you, Rihanna. Your name, you're, you're on the combo course, right? Oh, you were on the combo course. Right, so we will focus, try to come of course, we focus a lot of the drugs with the doses that you need to know, right? It's the same, the same question could also go with side effects. I get that question, people ask me, do you need to know all the side effects of the BNF of all drugs? No, just the common, in the GP, that's what I'm saying, the GP exam, common drugs are common. Mocks are different. Mocks are set to trap you. So when they're setting mocks, they're giving you those weird side effects and those weird drugs that you never dispense because I want to make it difficult so that I know that if you can pass this, then you're going to pass the GPS exam. But the GPS don't try to trap you. They try to give you common drugs that you dispense with the doses. So an example for most people, the hardest probably are anticoagulants, for instance. So your, your DOAX, so your doses for your rivaroxabans, your apixabans, your dabigatrans, you need to know those doses, the doses of stroke, the doses for knee replacement, AF. Um, you're going to digoxin, all your um, narrow therapeutic drugs. So narrow therapeutic drugs, definitely. So your digoxins, your phonotoins, your carbamazepines, you need to know doses. Um, common um, drugs like your statins, common drugs in your family, cardiovascular drugs especially, your your statins, you need to know your doses of your statins. You also need to know um, those sort of interactions. So I'll say, take that GPT framework and go through all your high-risk drugs. Learn your doses of your high-risk drugs. Don't forget your narrow therapeutic drugs. It's easy for me to say high-risk drugs, but you guys know there's also still a lot. Because antihypertensive, you need to know all the doses of calcium channel blockers, and all the doses of ACE inhibitors, and all. No, it's the common ones. And you will know the common ones because that's what we go through on the course. That's what you will see more. And um, yeah, that's literally, but now you don't need to know all the doses, literally all drugs. That will be torture. That will be absolute torture. Um, antibiotics as well. Let the doses. Also try learn doses. I said now therapeutic drugs. Also, just doses where um, you have certain interactions. Uh, like, how can I give an example? Let, okay, let me give you this example, right? Rivaroxaban has got an MHRA warning, right? It's got an MHRA warning that says if the high strength of Rivaroxaban, right, you have 15 milligrams and 20 milligrams, you need to take with food. That's a warning that is connected with the dose. Things like that, definitely doses you need to learn because it's talking about a dose. So if you have any MHRA warnings relating to doses, I'll give you like simvastatin, for instance. Simvastatin. Simvastatin, 80 milligrams is a very, is a, it will cause rhabdomyolysis. It's a very high dose, 80 milligrams. It will cause rhabdomyolysis. You have an MHRA warning on that. That is an MHRA warning connected with a dose. So you learn it, right? So any sort of warnings that you have connected with doses, simvastatin, right? You look at still simvastatin, calcium channel blockers. If you're going to use someone amlodipine and simvastatin, maximum dose 20 milligrams with amlodipine. Right? These are all, so these are the ones that are um, the more common. They're the more common to the dose that you really want to learn. If you go into um, aspirin, right, you have prophylactic dose, 75 milligrams. You have 300 that's used for ACS. So when you have like a drug where different doses can be used for different indications, I'm going to take like your, your bendros, let's, let's look at your thiazides. Right, bend your phrometizide. If you take 2.5, that's for hypertension. You go to five milligrams, that's for heart failure. All right, so those sort of doses where a change of the dose of the same drug is used for a different indication, definitely you have to watch out for. And then definitely your narrow therapeutic drugs, so you know that if you go above a certain dose, then it could be toxic. Those are the areas that, um, that's how, but it's, it's quite a deeper area. It's not an easy question to answer straight away. You have to do the, when once you do the course, you see, but these are the sort of things. Now, therapeutic drugs, and then any drugs that you have doses that have warnings about, or any sort of interactions with certain doses, definitely you want to learn that. All right.
Good. Um, let's see. I'm doing the November exam here. I was in the combo course. Great. Okay, great. Great. You're on a combo course. Um, yes. Yeah, so I don't know. I've got Kami. <laughs> Let me see if I miss anyone's question. What should be your last minute plan for revision? So when we talk about last minute, when does last minute start? Because it's different for different people. Just one second. I'm supposed to be having a session soon. Um, let me just adjust this. Okay, just um, so that question is asking me, what should be your last minute revision? So my first question I'm going to ask you, last minute is different for different people. For me, last minute is two weeks before the exam. That's already the end for me. It's like two weeks, I don't, I don't learn new stuff after that. That's my confidence building time. For some people, it's one week. Some people, some people, it's one day. It's two days. But let me answer that question for you, right? Just one second. All right, let's, let's do this. So... This is a tip I'm going to give you. So, um, Chris is asking, what should be your last minute plan for revision? When I started this, if you came in later, you could watch the video um, at the beginning. I said, if you came to me, for instance, and you said, okay, Faisa says last two weeks. Okay, Faisa's going for last two weeks. All right, brilliant. So, let me answer this question. So, um, if you came to me, for instance, and you said to me, Marvin, I've been messing around throughout my period year. I have a month left to the exam. I've got three weeks. I need you to help me pass this exam in three weeks. First of all, I'm going to say you're crazy. I know I'm good, but I'm not that good. <laughs> but no, um, what I'm going to say to you is, number one, you start from a GPA so framework. So leading up to your exam, you're trying to learn stuff. You have different stages of learning. And I'm going to tell you there are three stages. My experience dealing with students, you have three stages, right? The first stage with students, I've never seen this stuff before. I don't know this stuff. That's normally the beginning of learning, okay? The second stage, I know this stuff. I've seen it before, but I'm mixing everything up. Third stage, now is fine. Everything now is in order, right? So I've got three stages of learning, okay? I'm going to say that the first stage, I've never seen this before. Wow, it's all new. I am learning from scratch. The second stage is I have seen things, but I've seen it somewhere, Marvin. I have that with my students a lot. We say, oh, yeah, oh, I've seen this somewhere. I'm mixing things up a little bit. ACS, I'm mixing ACS with a stroke. Um, the management of stroke, I'm mixing that with the management of a heart attack. But then I know the stuff. I've seen it, right? So that's the second stage where everything is now. That's, a, that's, a, that's the stage where many people are about four weeks before the exam. You're in the second stage where you're still trying to like, I've seen it. They're not really surprised. I'm not saying things for the first time, but it's like, I still don't, I need to get it all together so I can answer questions. That's where the past questions come in because they're going to really test you. And the final stage is when you have the order. You organize things where now it is clear. I know the stuff. So, the final stage is the stage where your mental state is so important. It happens generally four weeks before the exam. So I always say this to people, even though some people don't do this, I always say to people that make sure you stop work if you're working at least three to four weeks before the exam. Four weeks might be long. Book your holidays. Right? Book those holidays and then stop. If you can't and you had only two weeks, then this is what you're going to do. Those last two weeks, how do you... like? You don't want to start learning stuff because it's going to take you back to stage two, right? Stage two is where, okay, I've seen the stuff, but now it's all over the place. You don't want to walk into the exam at stage two because that's when you do things like, oh, gosh, I knew this stuff. I got it wrong. I've seen it before. Oh, my head is everywhere. You want to go to the exam with stage three. Stage three is when things are organized. So your last week, last minute revision plan is about organizing information. I call it the organization stage. It's not the stage where you're trying to learn new stuff. It is a stage where you're looking at the things that you've learned and you're just perfecting them. Does that make sense? So my last tip for you, if you ask me, you go your last days, your last minute plan for revision is it should not be based on learning new stuff. It should be based on your smart on your on your cards, right? Your flashcards, on the notes that you've made previously. It should be based in organizing information not learning new stuff, you're organizing stuff. You're taking those things that used to make you confused and it doesn't matter because guess what? What most people do, you don't need to know everything to pass the exam. That's the first thing. The reason why we think we have to is because of fear. We know fully well that we don't need to know everything to pass, but we are scared that if we don't know everything, we will fail. 
Do you guys see that contra, contra, um, contradiction going on in your head, right? You know you don't need to know everything to pass, but you're scared that if you don't know everything, you're gonna fail. Right? So what do you try to do? You try to learn everything. But what that does, that's gonna put you in stage two. Because yes, you can tell me this as I'm gonna go through everything. I have to read all my notes, I'll do all of this. Fine, you've completed reading everything. Good, well done. Now talk to me about it. Information overload, analysis paralysis, too much information. So rather than do that, what you wanna do is that you wanna to specialize towards the end. If you don't know the stuff, don't, don't worry about it. It's, it's like too late now. What you wanna do now is get confident with the things that you know. I spoke about the nice chapters, right? The nice chapters. In my final days, if I have like two weeks of this exam and I've not really covered everything, definitely what I'm going to focus on is like to make sure that I have those high rating chapters done, make sure I have my medium rating, and then I'm going to focus. I went through some of the things on medium rating that you focus on, but I want to make sure that I'm spending more time now on what generally comes up in my exam. I'm focusing on my cardiovascular. I have to know it to the core. I am literally organizing information. If you're not in the stage, go, when, when, look at how long you've got left the exam. Look at these three stages I'm telling you about. If, honestly, you are like a week for the exam, you're in stage two or even stage one, we're still trying to learn stuff, it's not a good place. You're better not even trying to learn that stuff and then just look at what you already learned in the past and trying to organize it, trying to remember it, trying to know it properly. You just specialize in that stuff. So that at least if the question comes in the exam, you will be able to answer what you know. And I, and I do that with many students, and that's why I want to come, because there are many students that come in last minute and they still pass the exam. How do they pass the exam? Because they just ended up focusing on the stuff that they knew. Remember, you have an allowance to fill questions in this exam, right? Say like in, in clinical, you have 120 questions, you could fill what, probably up to 30 questions and still pass. In calculations, you could fill what, up to about 12 or 14 questions and still pass. So at the end of the day, even if you don't answer everything, you don't know everything, you're low rating chapters, you don't go through every single thing, it's fine, but at least you know the main ones, definitely go through those ones. And then ask yourself, what stage am I in? At least one week before your exam, you should be in stage three. Even now I'm doing private sessions with, with, with the students, we've been learning a lot of stuff, but already my program is set where that last week, if possible, two weeks, ideally I like two weeks at that stage. We're not learning new stuff. We're just going through stuff over and over again that you already know. My aim is at least a week for the exam. We're just going through stuff that we already know. And then the rest of it is your mental state. You're just building your confidence. You're just saying to yourself, I'm good enough, right? If others have done this, I can do this too. I have what it takes to succeed. Yes, I might not know one question. I might not know two questions, but that's fine. I don't need to know everything to pass. Nobody knows everything. But I just want to make sure that at least the things I've learned, I remember. That's what you want to be saying to yourself, right? It's not because you guys know sometimes the more you learn, the more you forget. Like you get to a stage in your revision where you're learning stuff. As this is coming in, this is going out, right? I've even experienced that. Like, gosh, I'm, I've read most of but all of a sudden I've forgotten what I learned last week. So if you're trying to learn new stuff in your last week before your exam, guess what you're going to be doing? You're also going to be forgetting the other stuff that you learned before. So the only way you could retain that information, you should be, that's the stage of retention. Organization is the stage of retention. That's where you say to yourself, this is it, right? I'm going to stop now. And what I'm going to do, learn, the, revise the stuff I've really learned and become good at it so that I don't walk into an exam and get things wrong that I know. And you're going to be fine. So, Margaria, I said from November 1st, only past papers and summary. That's my deadline. Great. Right? Great. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's it. <laughs> You're not just summaries. This is last week from first, so yeah, two weeks of your exam, summary notes, flashcards, don't start learning new stuff. Just building your confidence with what you know. Going through those past papers, building your confidence, that's it, that's it. And then hang around positive people as well. <laughs> Choose your friends, Choose your friends during that period. Hang around positive people. Don't hang around with people that send you questions every night saying, oh my God, you've not seen this question. Oh my God, we are, we are both gonna fail. Oh my God, have you read anything? Because I haven't read anything. Oh my God, it's the end of the world. No, no, they're trying to, to trying to sympathize and trying to make things all right, but then you don't want these people. You just want positive stuff. So I think we're gonna end there. It was meant to be 30 minutes. It was meant to be about 2 30 to 3. Gosh, now it's 3.40. But I hope you guys got some benefits from the session. I hope you can take away some things from here. 
Kiran says, what's the best way to go to the clinical to pick up migraine? I've gone to a number of tips in the question, Kiran, that would definitely um, answer that question for you. But thank you all for turning off. As I said, I'm going to try to do this weekly. We're going to have a weekly drop-in session. I'm going to see if I get a fixed date and a fixed time so you guys will know on your timetable, your calendars, you can just jump in. Vienna says, where do we find the GPS to compile questions? Most of those Telegram groups. Most of it. If you're a part of the pre-reg group, there is that on, on the Telegram group. It is on our Telegram group if you're part of pre-reg shortcuts. But yeah, thank you so much, people. And definitely stay positive. Keep going. Remember those stages of revision. Make sure at least a week or two weeks before your exam, you're definitely in stage three. You're organizing stuff and you're not trying to learn new stuff and new stuff and new stuff. So I look forward to seeing you guys again and all the best. Bye.